Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us here this afternoon. My name is Daniel Wasserman Soler, and I'm the executive director of the Lumen Christie Institute. And I welcome you to this afternoon's lecture, The Care for Souls and Care of Souls in Inquisition Spain. Our esteemed speaker, uh, Dr. Luan Holmza, and I were having lunch together, and I mentioned that perhaps an alternate title for this talk would have been Spiritual Friendship uh, in Inquisition Spain. Uh, how might those two things, how might spiritual friendship happen in Inquisition Spain? It is one way to think about our topic today, which gives us an opportunity to think about the Catholic intellectual tradition in a place, a time and place not particularly well known for things like uh, friendship or care of souls. This lecture will be recorded, and I'd like at this moment to thank our co-sponsor, the Department of History at the University of Chicago, and I also would like to thank the Department of Romance Languages and Literature, specifically Professor Noel Blanco Morelle, for introducing our speaker this afternoon and also for bringing some more folks here. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you. Um, so it is a pleasure to for me to uh, introduce Luan Hamza this afternoon. Luan is the uh, James Pigney Harrison Professor of History at William and Mary, and she is, uh, as many of you know, uh, especially the people in the field know this very well, a very noted and accomplished historian of Spain in the early modern period. Luan graduated from Scripps College and then the University of Chicago. So. This is, it feels like a little bit, probably feels like a little bit of a homecoming for her. Uh, she received her PhD from, uh, from this institution and her first book, Religious Authority in the Spanish Renaissance, published by Johns Hopkins, explores the relationship between humanism, biblical philology, and the, produc and the production of religious orthodoxy through inquisitorial debates. In this very important book, through a heterogeneous archive made up of uh, writings by authors such as Juan de Vergara and Pedro Ciruelo, in, but also inquisitorial processes and discussions about intellectuals of the time, such as Erasmus of Rotterdam, uh, Luan explores the relationship between humanism, biblical philology, and the production of uh, religious orthodoxy through inquisitorial debates. If her, if her first book showed us that the religious debate that produces the doctrinal norm and that functions uh, as imperative of an institution, such, a, of a, such an important institution, as the Inquisition, uh, is that, that such debate is more lively and more complex than we think, her second book is no less groundbreaking and complex. This book, Village Infernos and Witches Advocates, is one of the most revealing and rigorously researched works of recent years in the field of pre-modern studies of the Iberian Peninsula. Quite simply, she has, in my opinion, uh, rewritten everything that we thought we knew about Basque witchcraft and the processes surrounded it, surrounding it in the period between 1608 and 1614, thanks to the masterful but incomplete works of folks like Julio Caro Baroja and Gustav Henningsen. The recontextualization of the figure of Alonso Salazar y Frias, a lawyer of great culture and experience, but less heroic, let's put it away, and less skeptical than we had hitherto thought, is inseparable from years of pioneering work that uh, that uh, Luan carried out in the Dios in the in the. Archivo Diocesano de Pamplona, in the Diocesan Archive of Pamplona, I think I'm saying that right. Thanks to uh, her work, the relationship between witchcraft and gender, class, and childhood can be seen now from new perspectives. Particularly worthy of mention is her study of the, uh, until now, unknown civil trials, civil trials in which people accused of witchcraft brought legal action against their former, uh, against their, uh, former triers, against the people who were like uh, interrogating them. Any mention of Luan's intellectual work would be incomplete without mention the importance of pedagogy in her research practice. For her, and I think this, I think this, I've learned this through like um, seeing her through the years. Teaching and research are co-constitutive activities. Many people here might have worked with her selection of Spanish Inquisition documents, a most useful source for providing students with fundamental insights, fu fundamental insights into religious descent, conversion and other topics central to pre-modern Iberian religious history. In fact, I believe that she's also preparing a selection of documents related to her second project, if, if I'm correct, uh, but she can talk about that. Uh, what many here do not know is that Luan has taken generations of students at William & Mary to work with her 
in the Diocesan Archive of Pamplona, where undergraduates received a superb education in the study of primary sources and did astonishing, sometimes truly, as for me as a professor, incredible uh, archival work. Such are the qualities of her research and teaching practice. Generous, rigorous, and generosity. It is for all these reasons that I'm proud to welcome today my former colleague, Luan Hamza. Thank you so much for such lovely introductions. Um, my name is Luanne Holmesa. I'm in the, de the Department of History at William & Mary. I want to thank Danny Washerman, my old colleague, and Lewin Christie in the Department of History for making this appearance possible. And thank you so much for the text, for finding a box for me to stand upon um, so that you can see me over the podium. So I would be the first to admit this afternoon that the title of my talk seems basically nonsensical. The care of souls in Inquisition Spain? How could we take that proposition seriously? After all, the care of souls, in Latin the cura ad amarum, implies careful listening, gentle inquiry, a charitable outlook, and a calm demeanor. The care of souls in Catholicism is supposed to prompt people towards self-reflection and spiritual effort, as well as a more frequent reception of the sacraments and a deeper relationship with the triune God. The Spanish Inquisition, on the other hand, revolved around surveillance, compulsion, and public humiliation. It is true that Spanish inquisitors believed they were winning heretics back to the Catholic Church when they handed out penances after putting people on trial. It is also true that every person burned at the stake implied a failure of the inquisitorial mission, since inquisitors were supposed to strive for confession and reconciliation, not execution. Nevertheless, from a modern point of view, the Spanish Inquisition was a loathsome organization that identified religious dissent on scant grounds and promoted religious intolerance. Even modern scholars who recognize that inquisitors theoretically and practically often balance justice with mercy cannot disregard the malfeasance, arrogance, and cruelty that regularly accompanied inquisitorial practice. It seems logical, then, to conclude that a care of souls that we would recognize was not a priority or even a possibility in Spain during the Inquisition's existence. The Inquisition was authorized by the papacy, but it answered to the Spanish monarchy, and inquisitors would always choose kings over popes when it came to their loyalties. In its final incarnation, the Spanish Inquisition existed in the form of 18 tribunals spread across the country as well as Sicily, Sardinia, and the Canary Islands. It founded tribunals in Mexico City, in Lima, and in Cartagena between 1568 and 1610. It was a state-sponsored agency whose employees were everywhere. It would seem commonsensical to conclude that it inflicted itself on a populace that had no possibility of resisting and which absorbed its values wholesale. You will have guessed, of course, that I have been imitating the dialectical style of Thomas Aquinas. Here, then, is the reversal. The cura animarum did exist in inquisitorial Spain in a form we would recognize. To take the most obvious practitioners of the care of souls, Spanish bishops and priests promoted kind, calm, and astute attention toward the laity throughout the 16th century. Those clerics knew well the pivotal verses from Ezekiel Book 33, which explained that a watchman who failed to warn the community of impending danger would be culpable before God if that community perished. By extension, a priest who neglected to denounce sin, mend quarrels, and watch over the physical and spiritual needs of his congregation would be similarly liable if his parishioners ended up in hell. By combining the verses from Ezekiel with Jesus' remarks in John 10 and John 21, where Jesus said that he knew his sheep and told Peter to feed them, clerical authors in Spain believed they had a clear mandate for priests and bishops to reside. They adamantly tried to advance that point of view when they attended the Council of Trent and argued that clerical residence was a divine command from Jesus himself. They did lose that battle. Furthermore, Spanish clerics took the time and trouble to explain the sacrament of penance in print. Deliberately writing in the vernacular, they published dozens of so-called confessor's manuals between 1501 and 1600, and those texts laid out not only how the local priest or friar should conduct the sacrament, but how the average parishioner should prepare for it. We know that bookstores throughout Spain stocked these manuals at prices that ordinary day laborers could afford. Scholars have found that literacy in Madrid in 1559 approached 60% among males. If people could not read, they could listen. 
Significantly, the confessor's manual's attention to clerical missteps meant that the laity was informed about inappropriate clerical behavior and could challenge their priests accordingly. One historian has found that family networks deliberately advised each other about better and worse confessors. Teresa of Avila would have understood and endorsed that critical impulse. Yet what is truly surprising about the care of souls in Inquisition Spain is the extent to which it depended upon a horizontal rather than vertical process that turned on something called spiritual accompaniment. I did not invent that phrase. Rather, it comes from this woman, a Spanish biblical scholar named Mercedes Navarro Puerto. Professor Navarro belongs to the Mercedesian order. She co-founded the Association of Female Spanish Theologians and acted as general editor for a 22-volume series on women and the Bible. In 2003, Dr. Navarro published an essay whose title in English translation reads, Shared Adult Accompaniment, A Psychological and Biblical Perspective. This essay was inspired by the Christian Gospels and especially the 1995 film with Elizabeth Shue and Nicolas Cage, Leaving Las Vegas. Leaving Las Vegas portrays a companionship between a male alcoholic and a female prostitute who first pities him and then attempts to draw him back into the circle of life. The alcoholic resists direction. His autonomy, which comes down to his will to destroy himself, ultimately matters more to him than the affinity he clearly has with the woman. Yet even at the end of the film, neither character has forsaken the other. Instead, there is an enduring, clear-eyed, but non-judgmental bond between the two as the prostitute accompanies the alcoholic on his deathbed. Navarro recognizes that Christianity has a long history of accompaniment, but argues that we tend to overly confine the phenomenon. In common parlance, it usually belongs to a period of growth for young people, particularly life events or spiritual direction. In these instances, accompaniment turns on what? A stage, a critical situation, and experience. Instead, Navarro thinks the Christian Gospels transmit a deeper, different modality of accompaniment among adults, one that turns on horizontal, egalitarian, and reciprocal relationships. In her form, who matters far more than what or when. In her reading, Jesus not only accompanies, but asks to be accompanied. He creates a group of equals which expands constantly. It is not a closed system, just as Jesus never closed his community. Furthermore, Jesus teaches his followers in ways that allow them to discover wisdom. Their spiritual accompaniment is active and searching. Ultimately, Jesus and his followers together are creating the kingdom of God. So three caveats. First, I know of no Spaniard in the early modern period who actually uses the specific phrase spiritual accompaniment in any context. Second, we correctly tend to be wary of reading modern concepts backward in time because we want to understand our historical subjects on their own terms. Still, modern theses can inspire us to ask different questions of our evidence, which is why I've found Navarro's concept so valuable. My third caution is that my efforts to detect spiritual accompaniment in Inquisition Spain are not at all exhaustive. Nonetheless, the figures to whom I refer in this talk were well-known and popular in the early modern period. Approaching them in terms of spiritual accompaniment illuminates subtleties we have missed in early modern Spanish Catholicism. So who are these people? Juan Bernal de Alce Lugo, known as Dr. Bernal, who died in 1556, was a canon lawyer, an Episcopal vicar for the Bishop of Salamanca, a member of the Council of the Indies, the Bishop of Calahorra, and a member of the Spanish delegation at the Second Session of Trim. In 1530 and 1543, he published vernacular treatises such as this one that addressed the care of souls. Domingo de Valtanas Mejia was an Andalusian noble and a Dominican friar who became a renowned preacher and spiritual advisor. Between 1516 and 1553, he founded 11 convents. From 1525 to 1558, he expounded the New Testament in print and wrote an apologia on controversial topics. Bartolome de Carranza, died 1576, was also a Dominican friar, as well as an advisor to King Philip II and the confessor of retired Holy Roman Emperor and Spanish King Charles V. Carranza would become the Archbishop of Toledo, a member of the Spanish contingent at Trent, and the most famous victim of the Spanish Inquisition. Between 1547 and 1552, 
Carranza wrote Latin treatises on clerical residence and the duties of the clergy. In 1558, he published his, in Antwerp his Latin commentaries on the Christian catechism. Meanwhile, Ignatius of Loyola died 1556, had a conversion experience after a war wound in 1521. In retreat, he formulated the core of his spiritual exercises, which he would continue to revise for 20 years. In 1537, he and friends began to identify themselves as belonging to the Company of Jesus. Members of the Society of Jesus engaged in lifelong networks of correspondence. Their supporters eventually included Dr. Bernal and Valtanas. Dr. Bernal tried to install them in his diocese, and Valtanas published a defense of the Society of Jesus' order. So three of these four men were investigated at some point by the Spanish Inquisition. In a verdict of July 1527, Ignatius was prohibited from teaching for three years until he scrambled himself into some more education. Igne um, in 1559, Carranza was arrested by the Spanish Inquisition. In 1561, the Spanish Inquisition began to scrutinize Valtanas as well. Yet Ignatius, Carranza, and Valtanas published their ideas for decades before their arrests. The fact that the Spanish Inquisition pursued them had no impact whatsoever on their public reputation. Individuals at the lower end of the clerical hierarchy, or even outside the clerical hierarchy, also practiced spiritual accompaniment. They too suffered Inquisition trials, though they voiced their ideas for more than a decade before Inquisitors deemed them suspicious. An ordained priest named Antonio de Medrado was prosecuted off and on, I kid you not, from 1519 to 1532 for his firm attachment to a Spanish holy woman named Francisca Hernandez. Medrano eventually confessed to charges of false sanctity, abjured a grave suspicion of heresy, and ended up in perpetual seclusion in a monastery in Navarre, where he continued to cause trouble. A wife and mother named Maria de Casalla had dozens of male and female followers throughout the, 19th, the 1520s, she was prosecuted for heresy by Toledo's Inquisition Tribunal from 1532 to 1534. Ultimately, she was absolved for lack of proof, though she had to abjure a light suspicion of heresy for having communicated with friends when they were all imprisoned in the tribunal's secret jail in Toledo. Medrano and Cazaya's Inquisition trials are our only source for their beliefs and practices. So after close readings of their work, correspondence, and trials, I think these six figures expressed values that correspond to spiritual accompaniment. They elevated conversation, horizontal and reciprocal relationships, and an open attitude toward the potential composition of spiritual communities. Their aim was spiritual improvement, and they preferred a dialogical rather than monastic setting in which to pursue it. For instance, Valtanas asserted that human conversation could have spiritual benefits, quote, among the wise and virtuous, great familiarity in conversation should not be discounted. Rather, the more you talk with a person and the more virtue and perfection you become aware of in that person, the more you esteem and honor them and the more credit you give to everything they say. The angels always interact and talk with God and they do not hold him as less, but rather revere honor and hold him in greater esteem. Valtanas believed that virtuous people would improve each other through verbal exchanges. In Dr. Bernal's case, he expressed anxiety about friendship before he endorsed it. In his treatise on the duties of parish priests, he worried that casual conversations between clerics and lay people might diminish the dignity of the priest's office, quote, and cause penitents to not confess their sins with the appropriate shame to the priests with whom they have laughed or talked informally, end quote. Yet immediately afterwards, he wrote, my intention is not to make clerics so alone and remove conversation with their subjects, that they live in sadness and great solitude, and lose the fruit that good persons very often produce in friendly conversations, talking about in upright and useful matters about souls, lives, virtues, or estates of the persons with whom they communicate. These clerical authors also endorse an inclusive spiritual community and recognize individual spiritual gifts. Dr. Bernal told parish clergy to create confraternities to console the dying whose members would assist the priests with their responsibilities. Every member of that confraternity was valuable. Quote, It will not be possible for the priest to be there the whole time the ill person is dying, so he should make sure that some good friars or other good persons from the Pueblo accompany the sick person and console him. And those persons also may say devout things to the sick person on a topic which they feel would be most helpful in order to increase his devotion or receive more consolation. 
Ignatius of Loyola endorsed a similar vision. In a message from 1549, he told a fellow a Jesuit, quote, human talents and learning, efforts, eloquence, skill, and even the weapons of the powerful, end quote, had been deployed in the primitive, meaning ancient church, for the glory of God. Persons who carefully used their natural gifts in God's service were acting righteously, so long as they understood that God had no particular need of their gifts since he had bestowed them in the first place. Significantly, these men also endorsed the private, fraternal correction of sin. Valtanas wrote, To correct the faults of a neighbor with charity is a divine precept to which everyone is bound. To afflict the afflicted and not console, even if it might be for the purpose of humiliation, is against charity, unless it is done with real tact and prudence, end quote. Ignatius's instructions of 1551 noted that Jesuit superiors always should take for granted goodwill and make every precaution for the due observance of charity toward neighbor, end quote. He then warned that correction would be much more successful if it were offered with great affection and presented without offense. Dr. Bernal also urged priests to take particular care when questioning penitents about their faith. With a great deal of prudence, the priest must ask if penitents feel any sort of weakness toward the faith or are tempted by any error or doubt. The priest shall try with great charity and diligence to heal the person who feels weak and to strengthen those who feel tempted so that they shall persevere in the faith as good Christians. Obviously, these clerics knew they administered the sacraments. In early modern Catholicism, it was impossible to ignore the special role that parish priests, friars, and bishops could play in the process of salvation. That role not only was mandated by the New Testament and church tradition, but reinforced by the decrees of the Council of Trent. A truly mutual authority between clergy and laity was impossible when it came to the sacramental sphere. Yet within other lived experiences, worrying about the poor, consoling the dying, attending to children, aiming at spiritual improvement, this religious elite endorsed companionship with the laity. In their vision of the best spiritual world, lay people and clerics conversed and worked toward the same sacred end. In multiple respects, my examples from the lower end of the religious hierarchy, Antonio Medrano and Maria de Cazaya, who actually isn't part of the religious hierarchy at all, match spiritual accompaniment as well. Not surprisingly, given the fact that the only statements we have for them were given after they were arrested, Medrano and Kazaya explicitly respected status. They told the inquisitors that they valued the inquisition as an institution and referred to their spiritual gifts as puny. They cited their old Christian genealogy if it applied or mentioned blood relatives who were successful in the church if their family tree was damning. They also trumpeted classic charitable activities. In 1524, one of Medrano's character witnesses insisted, quote, I lived with him in an inn for three years, and he has so much charity and love for everyone, even for his enemies, that he takes more notice of them than a father would for his own sons. While on trial in 1526 in Calahora, Medrano listed this question for his defense witnesses, among others. Tenth question. If they know, besides the fact that I am a very Catholic Christian who is accustomed to follow the divine office, as befits a good priest, that I am a very charitable and giving man who is accustomed to perform many charitable works and give many alms to the poor, giving them what I can according to my position, and even more than what my position, rents, and patrimony require. I give food to eat to the poor and bring them to eat at my house, and I eat together with them like a very charitable man. Do we have a theme here? And I also visit the poor and sick, looking for them, taking them things to eat, and giving them food of my own. This is the only danger with standing on a box. <laughs> Kaziah's character witnesses also stressed repeatedly that she looked out for the poor. A Franciscan friar asserted, every time I went to beg bread and other things from Maria de Kaziah's house, she gave it. And I heard other people say that she gave to the poor, and I saw myself how she sometimes visited the sick in hospitals. Medrano and Kazaya placed themselves within Orthodox territory by calling up their public reputation as well for fama, or their, their reputation or fama, a category which has explicit legal repercussions. Their defense witnesses invariably reported that they only spoke with upright individuals. In 1524, when Medrano was under investigation yet again by the Episcopal Victor of Salamanca, his witnesses said he was chaste. He was a good Christian. His conversation was so virtuous that he reformed and consoled others. As a female acquaintance noted, he associated with the good and made them better. Quote, 
She knows many persons of very good life and conversation, and when Medrano interacts with them, he makes them more perfect. And this witness has talked a little with him, a little with him, and she has felt great benefit in her soul and conscience after she knew and spoke with him, and she only ever saw him interact with persons of very good life. Another character witness for Medrano, Diego de Mercado, said it was notorious and public that Medrano's spiritual impact had inspired Diego himself to join the Franciscan order. In fact, heaven helped the individual who was not good and tried to talk to Medrano because his style was to, quote, chastise everyone to serve God rather than offending God in any way, unquote. Less virtuous persons would find that they could not endure his conversation, quote, given his scolding and teaching, end quote. Identical sentiments came from defense witnesses for Maria de Cazaya. She was a friend to the virtuous and only associated with honest people. A cleric who had known her more than 20 years reported, she's jealous about virtue, and I have seen her scold people who did not live well and behave decently. When Kaziah herself testified, she noted that she deliberately looked for good confessors for the sake of her own spiritual betterment. Such evidence might imply that Medrano and Kaziah liked moral pecking orders and favored only limited circles of social and religious interaction. If such were true, they could seem to violate spiritual accompaniment's emphases on openness and inclusivity. Yet one of the ambiguities in Dr. Navarro's paradigm is how one chooses a community without practicing discernment and making hierarchies. If spiritual accompaniment pivots on finding real companions, then distinctions must be part of the process, as individuals gauge whom they might find compatible. Their decisions about rapport, of course, could alter over time. It's clear from the surviving evidence that Medrano and Kazaya used conversation to measure spiritual compatibility. For instance, Medrano's interrogatory for his defense witnesses emphasized his own speech. He described himself practicing something very much akin to the fishing that so characterized the early Jesuits. Eighth question. Did they know that Medrano customarily met with persons who wanted to hear and converse with him? And if sometimes he and other persons separated themselves in order to speak about devotion? And if someone else came near, he did not stop talking about holy doctrine, but rather enjoyed the fact that so many people came closer to hear him. In Kaziah's case, conversation looks even more like an overt search for fellowship. She seems to have ca talked constantly to other people. Her trial record contains virtually no allusions to solitude or contemplation. Instead, she was always out and about, reading prayers and the Gospels to other women and visiting convents. She also communicated through letters. She was literate. Witnesses affirmed that she spoke with gusto to men and women of all social classes. When she traveled through Castile in the early 1520s, people on the road stopped her to talk to her. The prosecution, not surprisingly, had a negative view of that talkativeness, thanks to the Pauline dictum that women should be silent in church and the consequent truism that women could not possess magisterium or the authority to teach. The prosecutor for the Inquisition was determined to view Kazaya's speech as instruction, which is why he accused her of enseñar, tractinar, y comunicar. She and her defenders insisted on instead on the possibility of theoretical communication, and they described her speech as platicar, platica y conversar. So significantly, Kazaya's conversation, discernment, and search for companionship extended to the hierarchy of the Catholic Church in the 1520s. Witness re repeatedly described her as speaking with the clergy. One defense informant after another attested that she publicly grumbled, Muraba, about ecclesiastics who peached coldly, friamente, with apathetic, heartless, or dull sermons. Kaziah herself testified about her own willingness to point out clerical missteps to the inquisitors. A priest named Diego Hernandez was reputed to be a man of little judgment, and he also had incredibly bad eyesight to the point that he had to hold a text up to his eyelashes in order to read it. When Kaziah saw him reading in this way, she asked him if his eyesight bothered him at the altar while he was saying Mass. Hernandez replied that he knew the text of the Mass by heart. Kaziah remained unsettled. She told another priest to tell Hernandez to be sure, quote, to put himself close to the book when he was at the altar, and he should draw near where the words of consecration are written, and he should put himself in a well-lighted place so that he can see the remains of the Eucharist and the purification of the chalice, end quote. When her counsel eventually reached him, Hernandez replied that the matter was none of her business. 
But he also reassured Keziah a number of times that it was enough to say the words of the consecration by heart, even if he didn't actually read the text. Clearly, he cared about her opinion, and she had no hesitation in evaluating him. Here, then, was a married woman, not a nun, not a beata, who watchfully assessed the competence of a priest as he consecrated the Eucharist. She made sure that her misgivings were relayed to him, and he worried enough about her judgment that he made an effort to reassure her. Her local community, composed of both men and women, had no difficulty at all with her actions, and Keziah herself actually explicitly relayed the incident to inquisitors. None of her defense witnesses thought she had been in error in criticizing Fernandez, perhaps because she stressed that her comments had been offered in goodwill. She did not go to the Archbishop of Toledo or Toledo's inquisitors with her complaints. She was pursuing fraternal correction, even though Hernandez became her enemy in spite of it, or rather because of it. So the concept of spiritual accompaniment reveals aspects of Catholicism that we often presume could not have existed in Inquisition Spain. I'd like to add one more element to the mix, one that Dr. Novato did not raise herself, but one that I noticed several years ago and that has stuck with me ever since. The element in question is, deduct is inductive reasoning, with an I, not a D, inductive reasoning. In the 16th century, many elites as well as non-elites in Spanish Catholicism grounded their spiritual discernment on what they had observed and believed to be true, rather than what they were told was true. To my mind, that difference is revelatory in terms of historical sensitivity and individual subjectivity. In the early 1550s, for example, Archbishop Carranza spoke privately with an Italian nobleman named Carlos de Sesso. In that conversation, Sesso told Carranza that he was troubled about certain aspects of purgatory. Later in the 1550s, Spanish inquisitors categorized Sesso as one of the chief fomenters of Protestantism in Spain. In his own Inquisition trial, Carranza and his defense witnesses argued that Sesso had not appeared to have been a heretic when the initial conversation took place, and hence Carranza was right to give him the benefit of the doubt. Carranza and his allies thus refused to allow a later judgment to define an earlier encounter. They insisted that they knew what they knew through personal experience. Examples could be multiplied. Juan de Vergara, secretary to the Archbishops of Toledo, correspondent with Erasmus, remembered exactly when Martin Luther had been declared a heretic and refused to apologize to Toledo's inquisitors for having read Luther's work before 1521. Maria de Cazaya right here was harangued by the same inquisitors for having owned a copy of Juan de Valdez's treatise, Doctrina Christiana. She pointed out that there had been no ruling on that work when she had acquired it in 1529. Later in her trial, she told her interrogators, quote, she has held Erasmus as good and has praised his works, meaning the one she has read in Spanish. She said that she would hold him as good until and unless the Catholic Church tells us something different, end quote. Her remarks imply a veneration for Catholic authority, but also reveal individual discernment vis-a-vis -vis that authority. Antonio Medrano's relationship with that troublesome beata, Francisca de Hernandez, had an identical foundation. For more than a decade, Medrano ignored episcopal and inquisitorial directives to stay away from her, and instead he continued to praise her as a spiritual guide. Structurally, it might appear to us as if Medrano simply inverted the hierarchy of confessor and penitent with this particular woman, but his preference has larger implications. Medrano was an ordained parish priest. He told literally everyone that he was being counseled by a younger female. He explained his attachment in this way, quote, putting to one side the blessed, immaculate mother of God, nothing I have read or seen has come close to what God has done in this woman, namely Hernandez. Again, his personal experience mattered more than what he was told by authorities. Medrano was pursuing a new mode of spiritual existence, one in which individuals chose their companions based on affinity and what they determined to be good results. Commonly recognized credentials were no longer accepted automatically. Public reputation mattered less than individual insight. One of Medrano's companions, or acquaintances rather, Francisco Ortiz, went even further. In 1529, Ortiz had a stellar reputation. He was an incredibly successful preacher. He did the Easter sermons every year in Toledo. He had friends among the courtiers of Charles V. He knew bishops and archbishops. But he too had been a devotee of Francisca Hernandez for years. 
and when the Inquisitors arrested her in 1521, he climbed into the pulpit of this gigantic mammoth church in Toledo, San Juan de los Reyes, and publicly, repeatedly, denounced the Inquisitor General for, quote, grinding down the servants of God. Instantly seized and thrown into the Toledo Tribunal's jail, Ortiz's trial lasted for three years. Remarkably, during his prosecution, he composed lengthy holograph letters to the Inquisitor General himself. There, he explained why he believed in Hernandez and had protested her arrest so publicly and adamantly. His reasoning was consistent. When faith in institutional authority was presented to him, or rather hurled at him, he argued on the basis of familiarity and experience. He knew Francisca. He knew her gifts. The Inquisitor General did not know her. The Inquisitor General was wrong to presume she was a false saint because she was not a nun. Ortiz denied that spiritual excellence could belong only to religious clergy. Instead, he presented the Inquisitor General with a sweeping and really poignant exposition of how, how religious excellence had changed over time. He wrote, Once Jewish ceremonies were necessary and holy for the Pueblo of Israel, and people who didn't keep those ceremonies were viewed as profane. And then there came an era in which those ceremonies were viewed as illicit, but not necessary. And then there came a time, which is now, in which those ceremonies are deadly and abominable and worthy of being persecuted with fire and blood, end quote. Ortiz was referring, of course, to the change in circumstances for the Spanish Inquisition's first targets, descendants of Jews who had converted to Christianity, but who were expected of continuing to practice Mosaic law. Ortiz went on to tell the Inquisitor General that standards of spiritual excellence in Christianity had shifted in the early church as well, from martyrs to hermits to preachers against heresy. He explained, the signs of sanctity varied in the church depending upon the diversity of the moment, end quote. He told the Inquisitor General that even now, in 1529, God could be depositing other holy women in the corners of his churches who had yet to be recognized. Ortiz understood and invoked change over time. Because he expected historical flux rather than stasis, individuals in specific situations were more meaningful to him than timeless formulas or traditions. He was not going to tolerate criticism of Francisca Hernandez because she was not a nun. He himself was not going to be placed in an eternally suspicious group because he descended from Jewish converts to Christianity. He explicitly denied before inquisitors that Francisca's status or his lineage could dictate moral character or religious orthodoxy. After all, history had disclosed the sanctity of non-nuns like Catherine of Genoa. Such developments proved the creativity of God and no one knew for certain how holiness might appear next. History was full of transformation. Individuals could not be confined to precedent or reduced to a class. Beatas could be as good as nuns. Conversos could walk away from their ancestry without a backward glance. Religious authorities were never justified in overlooking the individual in favor of abstract prescriptions or communities. Notably, Archbishop Carranza endorsed the same sort of historical awareness and discernment. In his commentaries on the Christian catechism, Carranza proposed that our understanding of divine mysteries also depended upon the epoch and could shift over time. People who were alive at Jesus' death grasped more about that event's significance, while those who lived in later epochs typically had less light about those mysteries. Crucially, however, Carranza refused to allow sacred understanding to be predestined. Instead, he argued that God could bestow extraordinary infusions of grace upon people who were living centuries after Jesus' death, and those individuals could be more enlightened than counterparts who had lived shoulder to shoulder with Jesus. Now, my audience might well protest that everyone in early modern Spain was interested in history, and my response would be to what end? There are big differences between writing history for propagandistic purposes or to prove the cyclical and eternal nature of time and summoning history as a more intimate source of knowledge. One angle is deductive. Rome was great, so it would be to Spain's advantage to be Roman. Heresy was always among us, therefore Erasmus could be an Arian. The other approach is inductive. The converted Jews around me are now suffering, though once Jewish rituals were venerated, with the best intent, I counseled an individual who questioned purgatory, though he later became much more radicalized. Remarkably, the same values affected the Inquisitor who turned around Spain's largest witch hunt. Alonso de Salazar Frias and his two Inquisitor colleagues were based in the Tribunal of Logroño, 
but they oversaw all of Spain's northern kingdom of Navarre, right at the border with France. Navarre is predominantly Basque-speaking. It was thoroughly unfriendly in terms of roads and weather. The witch persecution that occurred there from 1608 to 1614 was among the largest and most famous in European history. Spanish inquisitors in general never sentenced witch suspects to death at the stake, but they did so in this instance, in November 1610. The Spanish Inquisition as an institution never admitted error or absolved the guilty, but it did here, in the summer of 1614, when I kid you not, it annulled every legal record its tribunal had composed about witch suspects from 1608 to 1614. Historians have been flabbergasted for more than a century over these events. Now, Salazar was forced to go on visitation to witch territory from May 1611 to January 1612, and when he departed, he was on board with the witch trials already concluded and the ones in progress in his Inquisition tribunal. In the field, however, he became much more sensitive to contradiction and more contextual in his thinking because of his personal experiences with accused and suspected witches. Over that eight-month period, Salazar absolved more than 1,300 children as a precaution. You can see in the left-hand margin, he's got 1384 there, all right, to say the number of children whom he has absolved. He heard 290 confessions to witchcraft by adults and older boys and girls. He listened to 81 people revoke their original confessions to witchcraft. During his time away, Salazar was also informed deliberately about prosecutions occurring in the Episcopal and secular legal jurisdictions of Navarre for local defamation and serious local torture of witch suspects. The trials in those other jurisdictions had a profound effect on his reasoning, especially when coupled with the witches he interviewed who told him they had no idea how they traveled to meet the devil, insisted they were taken against their will, and they were dramatically repentant. Ultimately, Salazar decided to put aside elite demonology at his own tribunal's earlier trials. Instead, he allowed his judgment to be affected by face-to-face -face interchanges that occurred with witch suspects and local legal authorities. Thanks to his knowledge, his new knowledge, he began to realize that confession, the queen of proofs in Roman and inquisitorial law, could be elicited through torment and could be fundamentally flawed as evidence. In September 1611 in San Sebastian, he witnessed up close parental rage and terror and started to grasp how familial panic fueled this witch hunt. Families were desperate over the possibility that they were children were being taken by the devil to ven by sorry, the children were being taken by their neighbors to venerate the devil. The Navarrese in general were convinced that they would lose their property if one of their family members appeared before the inquisitors because that exactly that had happened in November 1610. Parents and relatives thus pressed family members into false confessions. Salazar was one of the only inquisitors in charge of this witch hunt who came to understand the crucial dynamics that were spurring it, and he only arrived at that point because he paid attention to the people in front of him. Ultimately, he relied on inductive evidence. Later, in 1614, he overhauled the Spanish Inquisition's instructions on witchcraft prosecutions at the invitation of the Inquisition leadership. So I suspect that one of the great balancing acts in early modern Catholicism in Western Europe lies between negotiating the relationship between inductive and deductive reasoning when it comes to religious and legal truths. One figure who brings this dilemma into sharp focus is Augustine Kazaya, Charles V's favorite court preacher, who was convicted of Lutheranism and died at the stake in Valladolid in 1559. In the surviving accounts of Kaziah's final hours, as he was being taken to the place of execution, he reportedly spoke to crowds along the way. We can see what he formally endorsed through what he now rejected. Out of reverence for God, use me as an example so you do not perish. Do not trust in your reason or in human prudence. Subject your understanding to the faith of Jesus Christ and the obedience of his church, which is the road on which men shall not be lost. Understand and believe that there is no invisible church on earth, but a visible one. And this is the Catholic, Roman, and universal church that Christ left, founded in his blood and suffering, whose vicar is the Roman pontiff in Christ's place. Understand that in Rome, even if it has all the sins of the world, the vicar of Jesus Christ resides there, who is our very Holy Father, and there the Holy Spirit attends, who presides over the church without fail. And do not pay attention to who the ministers are, but to the place they occupy and whose name they exist. And know that, however wicked they may be, 
God will not off, leave off working marvels through the power of the sacraments that he had left founded in his church, no matter how wicked the ministers may be. On his way to the stake, Keziah abandoned induction. It's difficult to imagine more heartfelt, choking testimony to the potential conflict between the church universal and the church before one's own eyes. The Spanish Catholics I've examined with you this afternoon were regarded as perfectly orthodox for most, if not all, of their lives. They cherished spiritual conversations and ties across social planes. Their values operated hand in hand with an awareness of individuality. They resisted agglomeration. They were actively looking for like-minded souls. They were generous with their sense of potentiality, as well as highly attuned to chronology, and they refused to limit what God might intend or might achieve on the basis of human-driven classifications. It's stunning to think about how the historical changes they witnessed and the impact those observations might have had could have affected their mental and religious preferences. The fortunes of a Jewish population, once the chosen people of God, declined to the point that it was expelled, forcibly baptized, harassed, and monitored. An Islamic kingdom in southern Spain was conquered and converted. An Augustinian monk in Germany, highly replaced in his religious order, became Europe's chief heresiarch. A papal palace was sacked by troops of the Holy Roman Emperor. These were ex dramatic examples of change over time, and we haven't even raised the encounters with the Americas, which amply demonstrated the gaps of ancient Greeks and Romans who tried to explain the world. I suspect the effect of all this witnessing to history was to heighten dramatically these Spaniards' awareness of change over time and their cognizant that traditions, even spiritual ones, were created by human beings. For them, the care of their own souls, as well as the souls around them, was a horizontal, amicable, and discerning process, and not one simply drafted by Rome. Thank you. If you enjoyed Professor Holmes's reference to Spanish witchcraft at the end of her talk, tomorrow evening, she's going to give a talk to a bunch of lawyers, but anyone here can slip in if they'd like. Uh, tomorrow evening at Swift Hall, around 5.30, uh, Dr. Holmes will give a lecture entitled When Witches Litigate, uh, which is the story of several Spanish women who were accused of witchcraft around 1600, took their cases to court, and won. Uh, so a fascinating story. You can also read more about it in her book that, that came out recently with Penn State. I, I thought I'd also mention that if you... If you like our events, please check out our website. We have several other events coming up besides the event on, oh, there's the book coming around, uh, on Luann's witchcraft research. We also have another event a week from tomorrow on Catholicism and healthcare. Uh, so we offer a wide range of events exploring how the Catholic intellectual tradition intersects with various disciplines here at the university. And finally, since I noticed there's a lot of students in the audience today, which is wonderful. I wanted to highlight one student program that we have that's coming up this summer. For several years, we've had a program called our Summer Seminars in the Catholic Intellectual Tradition. They are open to everyone, Catholics and non-Catholics. And the topics, uh, some of the topics include Thomas Aquinas on free choice, Catholic social teaching, artificial intelligence and Catholic ethics, Charles Taylor's secular age, Catholic, um, excuse me, uh, uh, Catholicism and the environment, a variety of topics. So the information's on our website. The deadline is in, oh, February 25th. Thanks, Michael. So coming up and tuition for these seminars, they're a week long, they're residential. Tuition is covered. The accommodations are covered. Travel and meals are heavily subsidized. So we try to make these, these opportunities as accessible as possible for students. It's an opportunity not just for intellectual formation, but also for forming meaningful friendships. You'll be living for a week with folks with similar interests and uh, we get lots of great feedback about those programs. So they're open to both. Some are open to undergraduates, some are open to graduate students. So I encourage you to have a look. And uh, with that plug, uh, I will I would welcome questions. Well, that was beautiful and brilliant and um definitely uh, dwarfed my um, introduction. But um, I have a question related to, you know, like a lot of what you were saying. <clears throat> so if I, I mean, if I understood correctly, like a lot of 
a lot of the like the uh, I guess the underlying what I would recognize as the underlying story to your talk has to do with like uh, mm, you know inductive and deductive reasoning in early modern Spain and things and things you know things that we normally don't think about when we think about uh, early modern Spanish religious history. Um, this one. Th uh, so in the in the archive that I'm that I'm, I'm actually current, I I'm, I'm trying to finish my book and and this last chapter that I'm finishing now has a lot to do with like religious debate in lay people's communities in the crown of Aragon in the 14th century, and I and and they're dealing with and they're dealing with particularly with with one very famous inquisitor with Nicolau Emeric, um and with and with Emeric is like like hellbent on on like persecute like at some point he tries to uh he tries to try the whole city of valencia and and like in a dialogue that he writes against them um he says like like his his accusation against them is that they are trying to take doctrine and religious matters into their own hands discussing them he, they're like trying to take his he identifies very clearly that they're trying to take religious authorities out of religious authority, out of the hands of, you know, theologians, and that's where the Inquisition comes against them, and and they're they're seeing us democratizing, and there's a very like one of the like basically the you know the 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 the, the most important fragment in, in this chapter is a fragment in which like he's Emerick is accusing them and saying like you're a bunch of like mm, cobblers and carpenters and like mechanics and all this stuff like who. Like who made you think that you can like discuss freely all this stuff? This stuff is like given to you. Uh, so I I wonder if I wonder if to your like more epistemological story, there's also like a political story about like people trying to people trying to take uh, people trying to take the discussion of doctrine into their own hands, or like that's off base here uh, in what you're saying. Thank you. I hope everybody was able to hear that. And the question of whether this has a political implication as well as a theological implication. And I would say absolutely 2000% yes, it absolutely does. Now, at the same time, ironically, what many of these non clerical people do who want to pursue an inductive religion, a personal religion where they choose things, they also will really trumpet in front of the inquisitors their background, their status, their royal connections, et cetera. So it becomes more of a standoff among equals. That's what they're seeking to choose. But this guy, Francisco Ortiz, is just astonishing in terms of his refusal to be told that the inquisitor general knows things that he can't know. He just says, it's not possible. I'm divinely inspired. Francisca Hernandez has cured me of the sin of masturbation with a magic belt. I have all kinds of visions all the time, thanks to her intervention. You don't know what you're talking about. You've never wanted to meet her. He even tells the Inquisitor General, you know, we should get her to pray for you because you're getting old, right? You know, and we should, her prayers could help you in one way or another. So they, um, so I guess what I always find so, Im so affecting about this kind of evidence is how dynamic it is. And we tend to think instead of early modern Spain as frozen, as if it's just solidified and nothing ever happens and there's no contestation and in fact there is so much contestation but yes i um students my undergraduates are always amazed to see how difficult it is to install the inquisition in the kingdom of aragon between 1478 and 1480 because the citizens of aragon are simply not having it right and they won't let the inquisitors in and ferdinand of aragon can write as many threatening letters as he likes and raise as many troops as he likes from Daroca. And the citizens of Teruel say, we don't care. You're not getting in. So I think that's really a helpful corrective when we think about royal absolutism, all right, and degrees of power and bureaucracy to see that there is this kind of pushback. Hi, this was all so exciting. Thanks for the presentation. I was curious, based on a project I had done about the um, the Converso families that challenged um, Juan Martinez Silicio's um, attempt to make a limpieza statute in the Toledo church. You know, there was so much creativity in their arguments, even as they were recycling. And I saw the same thing here, right? Like all of these different characters of like different levels of education, elites, but not so elite, feeling really like entitled to use history for their own purposes. I mean, I guess in a certain sense, it's an old question, right? Like, is this the Renaissance? Like, is this the early modern? Are people smart now? You know, that's not what I mean. 
I'm a medievalist. That's not what I mean, right? I, I mean, but I mean, I was thinking about it in terms of the 60% male literacy in Madrid, right? Is can we say there's something new about this culture of I'm going to write you a letter and tell you exactly what I think, and I feel really as an individual ready to do that, or would you not say that? But no, I think there's definitely something new. I think that um, the causes of that newness are really intricate and go back into the 15th century. I think that um, the span the the civil wars with the monarchs and the nobility in the 15th century that are so relentless could not have done all that much to raise their esteem in the eyes of ordinary people. Uh, so I think there are openings in terms of overseas communication and money and um, the push to have lawyers in your government. The idea that you could go to university, you could become a canon lawyer, you could become a secular lawyer and enter the government. There seems to be a lot of opportunity there in terms of um, uh, social climbing and money making. Okay. And I do think, you know, the kind of evidence you're talking about, it demonstrates how engaged people are with these topics and how desperately interested people are. And, and the notion that everybody is arguing and everyone's invested. I mean, we have hilarious anecdotes from northern Spain where a priest decides to go to France and dress like a Lutheran and his buddies from his home village get on a boat and they go to France and they put him on the boat and they bring him home to try to make him behave. Do you see what I mean? As if they are personally responsible for the guy once he crosses the border of France. So, you know, I um, this is where the idea that Catholicism is a folk religion and it's imposed on people, on elites, just doesn't work and falls apart. There's way too much investment and care, I think. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, thank you so much for this talk. It's It's been truly great to hear you. As you started off the talk with this, you know, common narrative of how we traditionally see the Inquisition, I couldn't help but also translate this uh, to like how we traditionally see the relationship between confessors and nuns. Oh, yeah. Like this idea of a lot of surveillance and oppression. And as I heard you speak, I remember like all the, the importance of parlance in spiritual autobiographies of nuns. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help but think, like, could we translate this idea of accompaniment and care oh, yes. to that terrain? And what are the dynamics that we should be careful about? Because, I mean, there's something specifically, you know, like cloistered life and the powerlessness of nuns when it comes to the power of clergymen. But I was wondering if you've thought about, like, how does this play out in the conventual setting? Thank you for these great questions. So Jody Billingkoff, who recently retired from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, has an entire book on spiritual friendship between nuns and their confessors. And she illustrates beautifully how, um, I wouldn't say inverted, but how fuzzy the boundaries can be in terms of authority. And the fact that con confessors desperately care what their nuns think about them, right? They really do. I mean, they are gaining prestige and fame from their association with these holy women. Their importance is rising as hers rise. And so I think that you're right that we've been overly simplistic about this. Of course, we've also been overly simplistic about the question of claustration after Trent, the extent to which it happens, the extent to which it uns yeah, um, desire it, um, flout it, etc. And that really has been, um, there are some, there's some wonderful new scholarship on this. Um, and I can send you the links to it if you talk to, to Mr. Wasserman, and he will give you my email. Yeah. First, thank you for just a wonderful talk. Um, it's beautiful to see something, you know, like when you mention Inquisition or witchcraft trials, one can easily imagine sort of the bulldozer of history mm -hmm. just running over people. And and even as a, as a viewer looking back to sort of flatten uh, the participants from that period. And I thought you did a fantastic job of breathing life into uh, these individuals. And I was wondering if you could, uh, sort of from your studies, what advice you have to students of history um, as you approach sort of these uh, from a modern perspective, and certainly as we can see from a contemporaneous perspective, like fraught and um, ethically weighty uh, periods. 
That's a very powerful question and terribly important, and I certainly wrestle with it a great deal. I think any historian of any epic anywhere on the globe finds themselves often in very uncomfortable situations with their sources, where there are torture sequences, there's violence, there's cruelty, there's poverty, there's abject uh, you know, neglect um, of all kinds. And the question is, what do you do with that in terms of illuminating it, contextualizing it? When you contextualize it, are you excusing it? Um, all of these powerful ethical questions are embedded in our practice. I think for me, and it took me the 12 or plus years of investigating the sources in Pamplona to write the witchcraft book that led me to this idea that I wanted to restore humanity, that I wanted to, that I was actually rescuing the dead and trying to present them in a fully rounded way. And I can't imagine personally, for my speaking for me, I just think that is a really important vocation and a mission to have. I'd you know, like to know more details about Augustine, I'll mispronounce it, Kazala, and uh, oh, like why was he condemned to be burned at the stake? Like from what you were saying, uh, his induction sounded like uh, he was uh, discovering uh, uh, a more uh, well true, uh, uh, the, the true spirit of the church. So one could imagine the inquisitor, uh, uh, if not agreeing with it, at least. Um, reaching a, 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 a maybe a, a, a decision that re reconciles the authority with this what might be rebellion but it sounds like instead it's more like because Kazal was criticizing what was really like corruption that that it was a political um upholding of authority we have the power <laughs> yeah so, so, were you referring? Because forgive me, my hearing is not really great. Or were you referring to um, Augustine Kazaya or Carranza? Right there. Okay. Okay. So this is a again. So just as my witchcraft cases with my inquisitors, who are really not bright, deciding to burn eleven people to death at the stake in 1610, which they never do. These trials in Valladolid and Sevilla between 1558 and 1561, I hope I have those dates accurate, are extraordinarily unusual for the executions. What the Inquisitor General does, a, a jerk named Fernando de Valdez, is he writes to Pope Paul IV and he says, I want your permission to execute people who've said they're sorry. And Pope Paul IV gives him that ability to do it. And that is just absolutely counter inquisitorial theory in every single source you could find. When people repent, you reconcile them to the church, you administer penances. You don't execute them as examples for other noble families. See the entanglement here and back to your nuns. About 30 nuns are executed in Sevilla between 1558 and 1559 for Lutheranism. What they call them Lutheranos, but they're really they're really Calvinists, all right? And the Inquisition gets so incredibly nervous about the social status of these individuals they're finding who are thoroughly embedded in the government of Charles V and Philip II that they hit the panic button and they think, we need to stomp this out, and their language is so offensive. This is not like those poor, miserable, converso people who would never rebel against us. These are important nobles, dukes, grandees, and their wives and their households. And I kid you not, they decide they have to execute them. And so it is definitely political to that extent. Um, and it's meant to throw a shockwave through Spain and stop this kind of protest from ever happening again. And it doesn't work. <laughs> the protests most certainly happen again, all right? Um, it does not stomp it out. But for an earlier generation of historians, we firmly believe that 1559 created a kind of iron curtain effect on early modern Spain where students are no longer allowed to study anywhere in Italy except at Bologna. Students are not allowed to go to the University of Paris. They're not allowed to go to London, et cetera. They have to be confined, and you begin to get index after index of prohibited books, and everything just looks more and more negative in terms of external context. But we certainly, based on more recent research, don't believe any of that to be true. But this was a kind of watershed moment in terms of, wow, just how political are you going to be versus Catholic? in terms of your approach to this. And you all probably know that Bartolome de Carranza is arrested for political reasons, too. Um, 
he and the Inquisitor General are arch enemies. And Carranza, Archbishop of Toledo, the highest primate in Spain, thinks that the Inquisitor General, who's the Archbishop of Sevilla, should go live there. The Inquisitor General does not want to go to Sevilla, right? He does not want to go lie in the sun and eat oranges. He wants to be around monarchs. So he declines to go. And the feud just escalates and escalates through the 1550s. And what Carranza does manage to do, despite being arrested, is to recuse the Inquisitor General from his own case. And if any of you read Spanish, the Spanish documents in this case are just mind-boggling, and they've all been collected in multi-volumes by a former professor at the University of Salamanca named Jose Ignacio Teyechea y Digras. And they're really easy to find. They're, they are absolutely in Regenstein. That I can attest. Thank you, Professor Holmes. Oh, well, thank you very much.